Welcome folks to the Regina District Industry Education Council Career Spotlight featuring the one and only Kristen Bellows. She is a registered uh, psychologist and she's working with Barry South. So she will share her journey with us today. Um, also, if you're a student listening or watching this presentation, please fill in the survey from the RDIC IEC website for a chance to win a $50 gift certificate and give us some feedback on, on how we can improve these sessions. Um, I hope that I'll provide some information that might be helpful. Um, and obviously I can be uh, reached after the fact if there's other questions that come up. Um, I, as Troy mentioned, work as a psychologist. I'm a registered psychologist in Moostra. Uh, I work most of the time as a school psychologist for Prairie South, um, and so that's serving K-12 students. Um, I also work in private practice on evenings and weekends uh, for a company that I have with a colleague um, called Insight Assessment, where uh, we provide primarily learning assessments, but also some behavior assessments um, for those that are seeking those services privately. Um, before I did this job, I worked as a school counselor in an interagency program for quite a while. Uh, and I also worked in a domestic violence shelter and an addictions facility. So I had a little uh, different perspective, I guess, uh, coming into this role, but always in, in some kind of helping profession. And I've been doing this particular role now for about 15 years. So as I mentioned, I work primarily as a school psychologist. Um, the number one thing that people seem to think of when they think of school psychology is testing and that's not wrong <laughs> there's a lot of testing that is a part of the work that we do um, and so when i say testing i'm talking about uh, intelligence tests uh, iq tests uh, as well as academic tests and um, that's the, the bulk of the work um, we assess students to figure out where they're strong where they struggle and what they need to have more success at school um, we do a lot of collaborative work with other team members, so that might be uh, speech pathologists or um, we have social workers in, in our school division who do a little more uh, direct behavior support. Um, there are a lot of consultants and um, teachers, administrators, um, it sort of runs a gamut. Um, we debrief our findings with families um, and with, uh, again, school staff. Uh, and we do a lot of different kinds of assessment. Um, there's a lot of uh, in-person direct testing, but we also do behavior ratings, um, observations, interviews, um, all kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> probably the most, uh, let's say, tedious part of the job has to do with writing psychological reports. Um, I spend a lot of time writing, uh, a, a lot. Um, and it gets easier, honestly, as the, the years go on and you start to um, come up with a, a system for communicating what you're trying to communicate. Um, but it, it's definitely one of the, um, yeah, one of the more tiresome parts of the job is the report writing. Uh, you want to get out and you want to be working directly with kids and with families and with teachers. Um, and if you're stuck in an office writing reports, that can get a little old um, at times. Um, we do do some training for things, uh, topics as they come up, self-regulation, um, self-care, coping. Um, I have a request right now actually to do something on executive functioning, uh, which has a lot to do with planning and um, staying organized and uh, working through tasks. Um, we do support and advocacy for students who have a whole host of challenges. Um, and it's really our job to make sure that we're working for kids to make sure they get what they need. Um, and if kids are understood, then um, we're better equipped to, to get them what they need. Um, and we also support classroom teachers uh, when they're asking, you know, how do I do things differently so that this student will get what uh, he or she needs? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I laughed when I was trying to think of how to describe where we work. Um, some spaces are better than others. Uh, we are itinerants. Uh, school psychologists are itinerants working um, with an office in one space, and uh, we sort of um, shuttle out to, to all different places. Um, 
I uh, myself have five different schools. So some of those are in uh, the city of Moose Jaw and some are uh, rural schools. So there's a little travel required for uh, my particular job. Um, in each of those schools, it is an ongoing struggle often to find space to work in um, because there just doesn't ever seem to be enough. But uh, most of the time, uh, we're provided with some office space or uh, we borrow an office or a classroom where we can work directly with students. Um, we are forever asking for uh, private quiet spaces because that's sort of optimal for um, assessment purposes. Um, those can be hard to come by at times. Um, I have a little picture of some of the equipment that we use, mostly because that's something that's oh, moving ahead on me. Um, the, the test kit that's listed there, um, we that's one of the most administered tests that we that we use all the time. Uh, our um, uh, WISC kits, they're called. So that's the Wexler Intelligence Scale for children. Um, so I used to shuttle from school to school carrying uh, luggage like I was running through the airport. Um, but that's changed a fair bit recently because in the last 10 years or so, um, there's been a move to more uh, digital uh, systems. And so right now I can do most of my testing using iPads, uh, one for me and one for my uh, client or student. Uh, and it's pretty remarkable how much uh, how much lighter my bags are uh, with, with that in mind. But um, we are, we're definitely, uh, on the go. So we travel and find spaces wherever we can to, to do our job. Um, unknown duties, uh, there is there's quite a bit of research that is also required. Um, things change fast and, and the more we learn, the better equipped we are to, to serve our populations. Uh, and so I think that maybe that's underestimated how much time we spend in research and, and should spend in research. Um, Another thing that might not be realized uh, for people looking at maybe a career in this field, um, for school psychologists in particular, there isn't a tremendous amount of direct counseling that we're doing. So um, we don't get to do an awful lot of therapy work um, unless you happen to be in a location that um, supports that. Um, but by and large, at least in this province, psychologists primarily do assessment and diagnostics and, uh, and in consultation. But there's a um, a much smaller counseling component to our work. Um, often there are social workers or school counselors that are hired to do uh, direct um, counseling with students, often based on the recommendations that come out of our reports or, or our assessments. Um, another thing to, I guess, to note is there's often a lot of participation on, on committees that uh, oversee how psychology works in the province. Um, it's, <laughs> It's some of the best professional development I do, honestly, is, is to participate in those committees. But I think it's not something that people often think of. Um, and, I'll, and I'll maybe touch more on that a little, a little further in the, in the presentation. Um, rewarding parts of my job, uh, definitely getting to work with kids. Um, you learn so much about so many different people. Um, and feeling like you're helping is uh, it's, it's a pretty powerful thing. Um, I love my job. I really, really, truly love my job, um, even though I don't always love writing reports uh, and it can be a little um, tiring sometimes, but I love solving puzzles um, is sort of the best way I've been able to describe it is um, when you have a, a child in front of you um, or a teenager in, in some instances and they're struggling and it's your job to help figure out what's going on. Um, and you gather all of this information and put these pieces together to find out um, you know, uh, hopefully a pretty comprehensive picture of this kid and, and you are the one who gets to help move things forward for, for that kid and, and helping them get what they need. Um, and I, I really like rooting for the underdog um, and working uh, to make school positive for every kid, not just, you know, those uh, A plus learner kids who uh, everything came easily for. Um, I often I really enjoyed the kids that sometimes other other teachers maybe struggle to like for that um, can be you know more challenging. Those are often my favorite kids. Um, so that's that's quite rewarding in this in this work, at least for me. Uh, challenges and stressors. <laughs> um, I said that demand exceeds capacity. So there's just there's just not enough time. Um, I I marvel sometimes at uh, how much there is to do out there and I don't often complain about it. Um, there is, 
I will, I, I will always have work. <laughs> There's no shortage. Um, but the, it can be a little overwhelming when you feel like you're not able to do everything that needs to be done. Um, I mentioned report writing. I think that's probably the number one beef that people in, in a school psychology role uh, would have because it is such a big part of the job. Um, another thing that maybe less, um, maybe less thought of would be um, when you put all the work into an assessment um, and writing a report and making recommendations that you you know poured your, your heart and soul into, and um, you don't really have a role in implementing those things. It's really your job just to make the recommendations. And then it's up to um, teachers and families and students to bring those to life. And it can be a little frustrating when, um, when you know what needs to happen for a student to have more success and uh, the people that are on the other side of, of that um, knowledge, or at least what you think was, was good knowledge, um, aren't able to make it come to life. Um, it's also really frustrating when, um, when they're trying and they don't have the resources to make recommendations come to life. You know, I might be recommending what I think is the very best thing for a student and there's just, you know, there isn't enough money or resources to make it happen the way that we want it to happen. So that's frustrating for sure. Um, I have a little screenshot here of the, um, I guess the salary grid for uh, teachers in Saskatchewan. So uh, at my particular school division, our salary is based on uh, teacher salary. Um, and then we have a consultant allowance on top of that. Um, in private practice, the current rate is $180 an hour, um, though you can, you can declare your own rate. I mean, your private practice is up to you to determine what you charge. But that seems to be the, um, the suggested rate from the professional um, associations. Um, that, that's actually under review right now. They're talking about increasing that. In some other provinces, it's you know, upwards of, of uh, 220, that kind of thing. Um, but some will charge more or less depending on um, their, their own skills, expertise, um, or expenses. Um, pretty lovely <laughs> benefits package uh, working in a school division. But again, that will vary um, depending on, on your employer. Um, in a school psychology role, we work the school calendar. So um, I work when, when teachers work. Uh, my hours are a little more flexible. Obviously, I'm not ruled by belts, kind of the same way that um, classroom teachers are. Um, but we need to be flexible in, in, our, in terms of our availability. So um, sometimes I have to be on the highway you know, at 7 uh, to get where I'm going. Um, and sometimes, you know, meetings go late or we'll have evening meetings to accommodate parents who have work schedules that they can't come during a school day. Um, so it is a little bit variable, but um, for the most part, it's a Monday to Friday gig um, and, and standard business hours. Um, training and support. So again, province to province what is required in order to license as a psychologist is a little bit different but in um, Saskatchewan you can either be trained at the master level or the doctoral level um, you must license you, you cannot practice as a psychologist without being licensed with the Saskatchewan College of Psychologists so um, that's our regulatory body um, and it's their job to protect the public so they oversee what psychologists in this province are doing um, and they make sure that we're practicing ethically and um, if someone is not practicing ethically, they can be um, under investigation and up for discipline. They can be fines, they can have their license taken away, all kinds of things. So in order to license as a psychologist, um, there's a provisional period where, uh, and it usually is about a year. Um, it can't be any longer than three years, I believe is the requirement. So after you finish your master's degree or your, um, or your doctoral, your PhD, um, you need to be supervised for at least a year where there's another psychologist signing off on the work that you're doing. You need to complete an exam called the EPPP, uh, which is the examination for the professional practice of psychology. It's about four hours and it's hard, <laughs> it's really hard, um, but it's passable. Uh, it just requires a lot of uh, studying. Uh, it, it's one of those tests that you you practice again and again and again um, all these practice tests and you just get better at understanding the format of the test and and you improve and uh, so it, it requires a lot of prep but it's it's possible um, and then there's an oral exam uh, at the end of that three years which um, I actually I participate on uh, the oral exam committee for the college right now where I chair on panels 
So myself and two colleagues will um, do an oral interview of uh, provisional psychologists who want a, what's called a full practice license, which means they can practice independently in our province. So they will submit their work samples. So we, we get two work samples um, and we as examiners review their work and ask questions about you know, why they drew the conclusions they did, why they chose the instruments or tests that they chose, um, how did they come up with those recommendations, um, what research they relied on to determine that it was the best course of action, that kind of thing. And at the end of that, if you pass, then you get a full practice license, which allows you to work independently in the province. Um, again, uh, under the supervision of the College uh, of Psychologists. So they, they oversee everything we do. Um, opportunities in the field, there's, there's about 500 uh, sites in Saskatchewan right now in different kinds of practice. So you, you are licensed with a general license. So we all are considered registered psychologists, but we all um, specialize a little bit differently. So I personally specialize in, in learning and behavior. Um, so I'm, I'm practicing school psychology or edu educational psychology, um, but there's forensic psychology, which is anything that has to do with the legal system, um, gero psychology, which uh, is working with seniors populations, and that is a growing field. Um, there's, there's a tremendous amount of um, interest there. Uh, counseling psychology, where you may do less assessments and diagnostic work, clinical, sort of working in, in health settings um, and dealing with um, clinical kinds of disorders, uh, rehab psychology, neuropsychology. There's a much longer list than this, but those are the ones that certainly come to mind. Um, in this province, the majority of the psychologists that are employed are actually working in uh, school psychology. That's the, that's the field that most of us are in. In terms of work-life balance, uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different fields there and uh, the, <laughs> the, the ways that people operate in their career could vary a lot depending on which um, specialty they choose. Um, and uh, I mean, for me, uh, working in a school setting, uh, I, I think it's a, a lovely sort of opportunity for a work-life balance. You, you do have to set good boundaries for yourself. Um, and I think that that's the case for any helping profession. Uh, where often the people who get into those professions are the ones who uh, they just care so much and they really want uh, to do right uh, and sometimes will go above and beyond and that's wonderful except for when it's to your, your detriment so um, it's always important in a helping profession to make sure that you're um, practicing lots of self-care and taking um, the needs of your family and uh, your, your own self uh, as just as important as the, the people that you're helping. I don't have anything else to talk about off the top of my head, but I'm happy to entertain any questions if, uh, if there are any. Great. Um, any questions? There's a few, a couple of students here, I think. Um, um, I have a question. Maybe I'll maybe start the conversation. Thanks so much, Kristen. That was awesome. Um, you talked a little bit about the education of having a master's, but where would you recommend students um, get that psychology, maybe that initial undergraduate degree? Is it the U of R, U of S? Is that basically the psychology that you're talking about? Um, I guess depending on uh, sort of which part of the field you're hoping to go into. So if you want to be uh, like the path that I took, um, I did my bachelor's degree. Um, so it was a bachelor of arts in psychology at the University of Regina. Um, there is a, a psychology program uh, at uh, U of S as well. Um, and of course, outside the province, there's you know, loads of other um, programs. I can't speak to the quality of any of those programs because I have you know, my own limited experience to draw from. Um, but um, the U of R had a, a perfectly adequate <laughs> program for my bachelor's degree. Um, I also did my master's uh, there as well. Uh, in the in the um, master of education program, which is a specialty in educational psychology, so um, you don't have to go that way. You can also apply to a master's program in a, in an arts um, or science, depending on which university. Sometimes they have it. Psychology is sort of a, a pseudoscience, so some will class it as a, a science program, and some will class it as an arts program. Um, but um, you you can just pursue. Uh, psychology directly without an educational component, um, but that does vary school to school. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, that does. And I do agree with you that the University of Regina does have a very awesome, <clears throat> very uh, reputable site um, department. And I think any student choosing to stay within the province is guaranteed a very good education. Certainly. Just to comment, uh, Kristen, I, I just, I guess myself being a teacher, I didn't realize that the uh, psychologists were in the uh, teacher's salary grant. That's, uh, yeah. Well, we are. That doesn't necessarily mean that, oh. uh, you know, that's everywhere, but that's certainly oh, the case. Right. That's not a standard thing. Okay. I just didn't realize that. Okay. Sorry. I didn't catch that. Nice one. Yeah. That's, that's, that's very good to have the same benefit package. And, and, mm -hmm. and, um, I think independent, because you can license as a psychologist with um, slightly different paths, right, once you um, get licensed. But if you weren't a teacher to begin with, or if you didn't have a master's of education, um, then you wouldn't be in the um, STF. So I'm, I'm an STF member. Uh, so they class me on a STF salary grid with a consultant allowance. But um, if I wasn't an STF member, the, the pay skill would still be the same. I just wouldn't be technically on the on the teacher salary grid does that make sense i think they just have a parallel grid for people who are out of school um look there's a question um on the chat here are you allowed to give medication to patients or do you just recommend somebody else for that right um so there's a difference between psychologists and psychiatrists so psychiatrists are medical doctors and they prescribe uh medications well all doctors can prescribe medications but Psychologists cannot prescribe medication. Uh, we would convey diagnoses. So for instance, if I diagnose ADHD, um, I would recommend that they have um, the, the student that, that has a diagnosis and their family that they take the report to um, medical doctor and do any rule outs and then they can pursue some treatment options that way. Uh, medication may be one of those options. So um, we have diagnostic privilege, but we don't have um, prescription privilege, like we, we don't prescribe medication, but we do convey diagnoses. You talked about the, um, the amount of, of writing that has to happen in your, in your career. Who sees, I guess for the students that are, are listening to this, and um, who sees those reports? Are they written specifically for the schools? Are they, is what gets sent on to doctors? Is that what gets presented to parents? Uh, like who's your who's your main audience and and the detail of of writing those reports? Um, all of the above, uh, actually. The reports that we write. So, in it depends. It's probably the truest answer. But in in my school psychology practice, the report that I write uh, is debriefed or shared with the classroom teacher and student support teacher. Um, and depending on the age of the student, so if it's a much younger student, they're not typically a part of the conversation, but high school students often are there um, to get the results of their assessment. So um, the teachers, the, the clients or students themselves, their parents, and then depending on the findings of the assessment, that may be forwarded on to um, physicians or psychiatrists or um, other professionals, so maybe a speech pathologist I'm, I want to refer to because I, there's some language uh, dysfunction that I'm seeing in, in my assessment, um, or an occupational therapist, or other professionals that have sort of uh, parallel roles. So um, any member of that team may be the audience that that report's written for. Uh, so it's, it's tricky sometimes to make sure that you're, um, you have to strike a balance between readability um, something that's understandable to, to everyone who, who may be the audience, um, and also um, professionalism, right? Like there has to be, has to be a very professionally written report for, um, to live in a file uh, indefinitely. Thank you for sharing that with our students. That's, that's good information for them to have. Thank you. Any other questions? What are the method, methods for diagnosing? Um, well, we use what's called a differential diagnostic process, which is a sort of a fancy term. <laughs> um, actually, this a lot. Um, oh, it says DSM. Can you see it? Um, there is, in that book, a commonly understood um, sort of set of criteria for a whole host of different conditions that uh, people may experience. And 
that's the common understanding. And so we rely on a DSM, so that, that book, uh, to have a common understanding of what it means to have a learning disability or what it means to have ADHD or what it means to have um, an anxiety disorder or um, what have you. So when I see a student or a client, I gather information from um, directly testing. So um, I will look at their performance on different measures compared to other kids the same age or other adults the same age to see um, if anything uh, is obviously, um, you know, an area of strength or an area of struggle. So if there's areas of struggle that are starting to emerge that I see, um, I, I make note of those. Um, I observe uh, how they're functioning in day-to-day -day life. I do interviews. So I'm just gathering a whole bunch of information through these different sort of systems. Once I get all of that information, uh, I have to then um, come up with a hypothesis or um, my best theory of what's going on. And then I can start to work through a process um, and, and use that manual to make sense of, okay, what do we call this? You know, is there a diagnosis that explains this particular pattern? And if there is a diagnosis, um, and that will lead us to um, services or supports that will help you know, improve the situation of this student, then great, right? Then we know what to do next. Um, diagnosis uh, is sort of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's frustrating to me because I don't like the idea that my job is to rubber stamp kids with a bunch of labels that um, now become their identity. Uh, however, diagnosis is quite important if it puts us on a path towards treatment and uh, access to services that we wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Um, for instance, um, an autism diagnosis often opens the doors to services that there's no other way to access. So um, as, as much as um, diagnosis can be a little bit, um, well, it's a double-edged sword, right? And if you don't, you don't want that to become someone's identity, but you wanna make sure we're opening doors for service. So um, the, the, the process is information gathering, checking that information uh, against the, the research that we have that, that helps us make sense of that information, um, and then writing that up in a, in a comprehensible way in a report uh, to convey a diagnosis. I hope that answered the question. I get a little rambly. <laughs> she said thank you. Oh, okay, great. So it must have hit the target. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm not seeing any other questions. So thank you very much, Kristen, for your thorough and professional presentation. It was awesome. I'm sure it will help um, students thinking about entering this field in their decision making. Well, I'm happy to help. I, I hope it was useful or that it will be useful to someone moving uh, in this direction. It's a really great job. Um, I love, love, love my work. I really do. So I, I do recommend it. It's it's not for everybody, but it's great.